so you've made an original scanogram like this one from the scanning exercise. It's saved as a TIFF file at 600 pixels per inch in a format that's no smaller than about 8.5 inches wide by 11 inches tall. This file is known as a raw scan because it's basically the image untouched as it came to you from the scanning process. We're going to use that scanogram exercise to create two unique works in the exquisite corpse round robin, your original scanogram digitally enhanced to become a work of art, and a collaboration with your classmates that will create an exquisite corpse artwork based on that first work. Now. There may be a few things you can do to improve the scanogram as an original work of art. For example, your background black may not be black enough, the white may be too gray, or you may have caught some dust or smudges on the glass of the scanner. Let's deal with exposure and contrast first, using some of the tools you encountered in the tonal range exercise. In an average image, you'll generally have a place that tends toward absolute black, and another that tends to absolute white. In an RGB additive color model, each channel, red, green, blue, is expressed using a scale from zero representing nothing in the channel to 255, a channel that is as full as it can get with that color. In a digital image it's a good idea to avoid extremes of information. In other words, you want to avoid an RGB black of zero and an RGB white of 255. Why? These extremes are impossible to manipulate tonal values in. So instead you want to aim for blacks whose RGB values are in the 5 to 10 range, and whites that are in the 245 to 250 range. This provides information in the pixel that can be manipulated tonally. So let's look at my sample, being aware that the values you have in your scan may be different. In Photoshop, open the Info palette under Window, Info, if you don't see it available. Identify the darkest area of your scan. Here, I'm just running my cursor over obviously dark areas in the background to see if there's any part that's the darkest. There's a small difference from this position, with RGB values in the 6s and 7s, to this position, with RGB values around 10 to 12. In other words, where we expected a uniform black, we find a bit of variation. So here's how to cheat that. First, we apply levels adjustment layer, then use the black point eyedropper tool in the higher value black zone. You'll see a jump in the dark areas of the scan overall, and as you hover your cursor over black areas, you'll see values of zero or maybe one all around. Wait, aren't we supposed to avoid zero? Well, watch this space. Now do the same thing for any white area you may have, keeping in mind your scan may not actually have a white area, in which case skip this step. Use the white point eyedropper to set a white point. With the white point you can often inadvertently create a color cast, so try to find a pixel point that keeps your color intact but gets you a good white point. Again, we're supposed to avoid 255, but don't worry. We're not done yet. Next we're going to remedy those zeros and 255s by using an exposure adjustment layer. Use the offset slider to bump the black point from 0 or 1 up to between 5 and 10. This is a tiny tweak in my sample of only plus point zero 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 five. That brings the black point to about 8. Now we use the exposure slider to bump the white point down from 255 to about 245 or so. In my sample, again just a small tweak of minus point 0.1 does the job. Now. If you happen to detect a color cast after this manipulation, you can manipulate it out using the color balance adjustment layer. How do you know what kind of color cast you have? Hover over any part of the image that you think should be a neutral gray tone, and you should see RGB values in the info palette that are within 5 to 10 units of each other. In my sample, in this upper mid-tone gray area on the piglet, there is a small loss of red by about 20 units as compared to the green. There is also a small uptake of blue about 20 units higher than the green. This gives this area a slight cyan tone. Setting the color balance to affect mid-tones, I shift the red up about 20 or 25 units, and I knock the blue down about 10 to 20 units, then I inspect the info palette. The red value is within 10 of the green, and so is the blue. I toggle the preview eye icon to see the difference, and I'm satisfied that the color cast is eliminated. Turn these adjustment layers on and off and you can see how even these small tweaks have a big effect on quality. Save the work at this point, changing the name to UU, XCorps, 600.TIF, where UU is the random number you've been assigned and XCorps is a shorthand name for the collaboration. Save a copy of this file to a new folder named UU, XCorps, History, and back it up to your cloud portfolio. Remember there are underscores wherever there are spaces in good file naming convention. You won't hear me read them aloud in this demo. 
Now we'll make a new copy of this file and we're going to resample the image down to a print ready resolution. We don't need a 600 ppi file for printing, but we scanned it large just in case. You never know if you'd like to make a larger scale work out of it someday. Simply go to menu, image, image size, and set resample on 4 by cubic sharper, since we are downsampling. Change the resolution to 300, and save the file as a copy with the name UU. Xcorps300.tif, where 300 indicates the new resolution. In this version of the TIFF file, we will uncheck layers, which will flatten the layers to hardwire the adjustments. Again, we have earlier states where the raw scan information is intact, so this is safe to do, and important for the collaboration. Put this historical state of the file in your history folder. Now we are going to start working the file to create a common size and format for the collaboration. We want every file in the collaboration to be 8 inches wide and 9 inches tall at this resolution of 300. So first, let's open menu, image, image size, and with a bicubic sharper resample again, change the width from its current width down to 8. Next, we'll use the menu, image, canvas size to establish the height of 9 inches. This may break your heart because you'll lose some of the scan, but remember that you've saved historical states of the file that preserve what you'll lose in this copy. Already this historical state exercise is paying dividends. Go to menu, image, canvas size, and notice the anchor icon near the bottom. The dot represents the focus for retaining the image. For example, I'll set the anchor to center. Enter 9 for the height and hit return. I get the warning dialog that I'm about to clip info, and I say proceed. Inspecting the image, if I don't like what happened, I can undo, and try a different anchor. I'll try the center bottom now, and I like this composition better. One thing we might look at before we save is whether there is any dust or mess we'd like to eradicate. I deliberately left my scanner a bit dirty to demonstrate these techniques. There's a big ring stain on the glass, and lots of white specks of dust. We could just use the dust and scratches filter to get rid of them, but that filter will more often get rid of detail you actually want to keep. So here's a trick. First, we will go to menu, select, color range, and open the dialog box. We'll set a black point target with the black point eyedropper, then dial up the fuzziness to about 20 and click OK. This selects all the docks from about 30 downward, but it didn't select the dust. To get the dust, we go to menu, select, modify, expand, and in the dialog box we add about 3 pixels to the selection. As a safety step to keep away from fragile edges, we'll go to menu, select, modify, contract, and enter a generous 10 pixel margin to the selection set. You can see most of the dust is still selected. The selection set has left the subtle bubble wrap texture alone, but it's also still left the ring. We'll use a lasso tool and toggle add using the shift key, and we'll draw around the ring until it's added to the selection set. Now, with only the uniform black background selected, we can go to menu, filter, noise, dust and scratches and we can dial in a big radius of 24 and a low threshold of around 50 or 60 to kill the dust. Only the ring still survives, and this we'll kill with a clone stamp. Clone stamp is a two-part tool. First, set the target for pixel information you want to clone by hitting option plus the tool once, then click hold and drag the tool to clone the pixels over the stain. Yes, this is destructive without creating a new layer, but this is a pretty safe fix, and I have earlier states saved in my archive. Be careful using tools like these as they do tend to eat up the file history. Look in the history palette from time to time to see that you're not using up too much. After this cleanup, save a copy, and call this copy of the file UU, Xcorps, 300, 8x9.tif, where 8x9 indicates the new format, and save it to your history archive folder. We're almost done with our manipulations, but we have a final one to do. First, notice in the finder window how large these TIFF files are. They are uncompressed files, and even though the last state was flattened it's still nearly 20 megabyte large. This file will be good to share with the exquisite corpse round robin because the uncompressed file will not degrade in quality. But it's a terrible file to upload and share on your blog because it's unnecessarily large for that purpose. A high quality compressed JPG will display nicely but will be kinder to your client trying to view it. So we change the file type by performing a save as and creating a high quality JPG at 12 with a baseline standard format. The JPG is under 4 megabytes, smaller than even a quarter the size of the TIFF. Place this file in your history folder. You now have four historical states of the file, the first correcting color, the second creating print ready resolution, the third creating a new format to share, and the final JPEG ready to post to your blog.
If you ever decide you made a terrible choice at any of these historical states, you've preserved data that you can return to and try something different. Also, if a colleague accidentally breaks your share file during the collaboration, you have data in the history states that will allow you to repair it. The key is to never overwrite a file so you lose the original raw scan information or the part of the workflow you want to keep.